What's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So today I want to talk about fund manager Terry Smith. Okay, he recently wrote a book called Investing for Growth. First heard about it through Monish Pabrai, and it is fantastic. Okay, I've been tearing through it. Uh, I've also found Fundsmith has put out uh, annual meetings. Uh, so I watched the last three years of annual meetings with Terry Smith just to get uh, a different perspective on what he's doing with the fund. Uh, in 2020, Terry Smith added four positions to Fundsmith. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about those and you know what their what their metrics look like uh, in terms of what Terry Smith really pays attention to. Uh, but first, I want to share just some notes that I've taken both from the book and from these last three annual meetings. Uh, the first thing I want to touch on here is uh, a quote from Charlie Munger, okay? And the quote is, your return over the long run will converge with the return on capital that the underlying business generates, okay? And Terry Smith really took that to heart. Uh, the most important thing is not margin of safety. It's not getting the lowest price possible, Okay, uh, the most important thing is investing in good companies. Okay, and Terry Smith has a very specific way that he kind of looks for uh, signs that, that a company is good. Uh, so we're going to get into that as well. Uh, so it's really just these three things. Invest in good companies. Don't overpay, which is the second one. And then do nothing, which totally resonates with me. You know, I've been uh, downloading from Monish Pabrai lately. He's been influenced by Nick Sleep. And there's just been a lot uh, in the space on YouTube from these investors about treating the businesses you own as an entrepreneur. Okay. So you're in it for the long haul. So that's great timing. Um, so this is Fundsmith in terms of the metrics that they really pay attention to, okay? And this represents, you know, they, they started the fund, I believe it was 2008. Uh, so we've got, what, the last seven, eight years here of uh, sort of the weighted average numbers. For, for these different metrics. The first one is return on capital employed. According to Terry Smith, this is the single best metric for determining how good a business is, okay? Return on capital employed. And you can see through each of these years, the weighted average of the ROCE of companies in the Fundsmith portfolio. And then you can compare that for example, in 2020, it was 25%. We can compare that with the ROCE of the S&P 500 and of the FTSE 100, which is the London kind of S&P equivalent. Um, so, you know, it's like two and a half times higher return on capital employed for the companies within Fundsmith, okay? So that's the big first metric. Uh, the second one I want to talk about is gross margin, okay? The way that Terry Smith uh, paints the picture of gross margin is if you have a 65% gross margin, uh, the business is making things for 35 cents and selling them for a dollar, okay? That's the effective way to look at that. Now, with the S&P 500, companies are making things for 56 cents, and selling them for a dollar, okay? So a uh, pretty big difference there in gross margin between what Fundsmith owns and what the S&P 500 is made up of. Uh, so these are the kind of big two metrics in terms of how great a business is. Uh, another thing I want to point out in terms of inflation, right, there's a lot of fear of rising inflation in our current environment. Uh, Terry Smith thinks probably the best way to protect oneself, one's portfolio against inflation, 
uh, is to have high gross margins, okay? Because high gross margins uh, indicate that you have pricing power, that a business has pricing power, right? Because it's able to, uh, you know, make something for 35 cents and sell it for a dollar, right? Uh, so that that indicates that there's a lot more pricing power there than, say, uh, a business that makes things for 60 cents and sells them for a dollar. So I thought that was an interesting point. So those are the, the big two metrics in terms of quality. Uh, of course, there are others as well. Uh, and then I want to get into the don't overpay. What is the metric for figuring out if you're overpaying or not. So for Terry Smith, the metric is free cash flow yield. Okay, free cash flow yield. Now, um, it's really just free cash flow. Like what is the free cash flow that the business generates uh, divided by the market cap? Okay, um, so for the positions in Fundsmith Equity Fund, this is the average historic yield, okay, looking back uh, through the life of the Fundsmith Equity Fund, a 2.8% free cash flow yield. Compared to the S&P uh, with non-financials, 3.7%. So you can see here, uh, Fundsmith pays up, right? They pay significantly more to own these great businesses. Um, but, you know, in, in, in the words of Terry Smith, you know, we're, we're paying more for companies that are much, much better. OK, and we want to hold those companies for a long time. So, um, yeah, th this this framework just really resonates with me. Uh, so that's kind of a quick overview of the, the core metrics that Terry Smith focuses on for both what makes a business great and, you know, how much to pay, what, what's a reasonable price to pay uh, for these businesses. Um, so let's go through some of these notes. Uh, let's see here. Oh, this was interesting. So the, the other part is do nothing. Okay, so what, is, what does do nothing mean, right? Well, it's obvious to most of us, it means hold these companies for a long time, right? Treat them as long-term stakes in a business. So the way that Terry Smith measures that is the portfolio turnover rate, okay? Uh, the portfolio turnover rate in 2020 was 4%. Uh, and my understanding of that, I think there's like 27 positions in Fundsmith, so they're basically selling out of one position each year, okay? Buying one, selling one. That's, to me, that, that's what a 4% turnover uh, rate means. So, you know, per, pretty sparse trading, uh, which really keeps fees down. Uh, in 2020, there were four companies that were added to Fundsmith, okay? Uh, Nike, in, in the UK they call it Nike, we call it Nike here in the US. Uh, so Nike, Starbucks, LVMH, which is Louis Vuitton, and Church and Dwight, okay, Church and Dwight. So those were the four companies that were bought in 2020. I went through with the help of Ticker Terminal, and I basically came up with uh, what are these three core metrics for each of these companies? Uh, now, return on capital employed, the way I got that was operating income or EBIT divided by uh, the weighted average over the year of total assets minus total current liabilities. Okay. Um, so that shows up as a percentage here in the ROCE. So you can see over the last 10 years for Nike uh, what the ROCE has been. And it looks very good, right? Uh, other than 2020, which, 
you know, obviously was hit hard by the pandemic. People aren't necessarily going out and buying new shoes uh, when it looks like the economy is going to come, you know, to a screeching halt. So uh, it took a dip there, but look at 2021, right? It's up to 28%, which is fantastic. So uh, like I mentioned, 25% was the average in year 2020 for Fundsmith. So you can see here, uh, the average for Nike is above the average for Fundsmith. Or basically on par with the historic uh, numbers for return on capital employed. Now we look at percent gross margins for Nike, a little lower uh, than, than what I'd like to see. Uh, again, Fundsmith was around 65% gross margins on average. Uh, Nike is closer to 45%, okay? So that's uh, significantly lower. Uh, you can see here 45% is around what the S&P 500 uh, is doing in terms of gross margins. Uh, in terms of free cash flow yield, uh, based on the latest numbers, we've got about 2.3% free cash flow yield. So uh, pretty low, right? Seems expensive. Uh, but, you know, in 2020, during the, the trough, right, when, when the price was lowest in March of 2020, uh, the free cash flow yield was 5.6%. Now, this free cash flow yield uh, is assuming the latest free cash flow numbers, right? It's not assuming the free cash flow numbers in 2020. So you'd have to be able to see uh, a rebound coming with Nike to be able to uh, take advantage of, you know, that particular free cash flow yield. But, um, yeah. If, if they were able to get it uh, near the trough in 2020, kind of seeing the trend of free cash flows and, you know, knowing that Nike was going to be able to ride out the pandemic, uh, which, you know, it, it wouldn't have been that hard to, um, to make that assessment given how great of a business Nike is, uh, potentially pretty compelling uh, in terms of free cash flow yields, at least forward free cash flow yield. Uh, so that's Nike. I can see why they'd be interested in Nike. Uh, Starbucks. Uh, so Starbucks is is a little scary. You know, the, the return on capital employed was pretty phenomenal. Um, even up through 2018, the, the last couple of years... Uh, we've really seen it drop. And th this was pre-pandemic, obviously. So I'm a little concerned about this trend from 39 to 27 to 25 uh, and then kind of continuing down. Uh, I definitely want to understand better what's happening with the return on capital employed for Starbucks. Uh, and then again, percent gross margins, right? I mean, we know Starbucks got slammed in 2020 because uh, I'm sure a lot of the stores just had to shut down. Uh, maybe they were able to continue with the drive-through uh, for those locations that had drive-throughs. Uh, but these gross margins, you know, they leave a lot to be desired, at least for me, like around 30%. Uh, if you look at kind of the median over the last five years, 30% uh, is hard for me to get excited about. They're spending 70 cents, right, to make the product and selling it for a dollar. That's uh, pretty thin. And we look at free cash flow yield, currently 3.3%. Um, could have been around 6.6% at the trough. Again, assuming you can look forward uh, to estimate those kind of last 12 months of free cash flows. Uh, so, you know, it's hard for me to get past the current gross margins, but, you know, maybe I, I'm probably missing something about Starbucks that just isn't showing up in the numbers here. Uh, we got Louis Vuitton, which is a uh, luxury goods company. Um, return on capital employed. 
again, leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, sort of the, the peak ROCE is around 18% over the last decade, okay? Which, you know, 18%, certainly better than the S&P 500, uh, but nowhere close to the Fundsmith average. Um, so there may, again, there may be something that's not showing up in the numbers um, that's, you know, nuanced for Louis Vuitton's uh, b particular business model. Gross margins on point, okay? We've got 65, 66, 67% gross margins, which is fantastic. Uh, free cash flow yield currently 5.1%. That's quite strong. Um, and, you know, at the trough, right, uh, the price was less than half of what it is now in terms of the share price. So uh, forward free cash flow yield, you know, 10 or 11 percent. OK, that is phenomenal um, for for a business like this. So there's sort of an overview of Louis Vuitton. And then finally, we have Church and Dwight. Uh, return on capital employed, you know, nothing to write home about. Certainly better than the S&P, but nowhere really near uh, the average for Fundsmith. Again, gross margins, 45%. Nothing to get too excited about. That's about on par with the index. Uh, free cash flow yield, 3%. Okay, very close to the historic average for Fundsmith. And, you know, you, you didn't get a lot better with the trough. Uh, the price for Church and Dwight stock really didn't go down too much uh, in the pandemic. So uh, interesting as well with Church and Dwight. And I believe this was the most recent addition out of these four companies for Fundsmith. Now, uh, during the 2019 annual meeting uh, for Fundsmith, Terry Smith mentioned uh, because of the size of the fund, because of the size of Fundsmith, uh, at 17 billion pounds, uh, assets under management, they can't really buy companies that are under a 2 billion pound market cap, okay? So can't buy small caps effectively. Uh, but what they did is they started this investment trust. I believe it was 2018, near the end of 2018, uh, for those opportunities for small and mid cap companies that kind of fit this same, um, you know, framework, looking for, for great businesses, uh, not paying too much and holding long term. So this is actually much more interesting to me than the, um, you know, larger fund Smith fund. Uh, and I did a little digging into uh, this one. And it looks like the most recent acquisition, which as of January 2021, they say we began buying a new position for the fund, the name of which will be revealed once we have you know, built a full position. That company is Wingstop, okay? Sort of a, a Wings fast food franchise, all right? So um, that's kind of interesting. Wingstop, I, I haven't done any digging. I really just discovered this little nugget uh, about an hour ago as I was making the final preparations for this video. Uh, but this Smithson Investment Trust is definitely one I'm going to be watching for new ideas uh, in the kind of small and mid cap space. So uh, I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about this one from me in the future. Um, so let's see, I want to share a few more notes from, uh, you know, I took a ton of notes. Um, right, so there was an exercise around inflation that Terry Smith went through. I already mentioned sort of having a, a high gross margin can, can be a, 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 you know, protection against rising inflation. So Terry Smith went through a little example where you know, let's assume the cost of goods sold increases 5% for, you know, one of the, the Fundsmith companies and sort of an average company in the S&P 500. Uh, a 5% inflation in the rise of COGS 
uh, results in a 6% profit loss, right? A 6% hit for one of these Fundsmith companies and an 18% hit uh, for one of these S&P 500 average companies, okay? Uh, because of the difference in gross margin, the difference in return on capital employed. And if you think about it, right, if inflation rises, um, say inflation rises to 10%, and you have companies where your return on capital employed is around 25%, okay, uh, you still have sort of a, an effective margin of safety, right? Because uh, your return on capital employed is still so much higher than the rate of inflation. Now, if your investments have a 10% return on capital employed, right, which is close to the average of the S&P 500, and inflation is at 10%, uh, that's not a good position to be in, all right? Uh, your effective returns are basically zero, okay? So, you know, that, that effective margin of safety with the high returns uh, can really help in an inflationary environment. Um, what else do I want to say? There, there's a ton of good stuff if you guys, I, I highly recommend you go through each of these annual meetings. Um, so there, Terry Smith has asked about oil and gas companies because, you know, prices just went through the floor, uh, in 2020. He said, we are trying to own businesses that can go on delivering value forever. OK, obviously, no business is actually going to do that. Um, at least none have so far. Uh, but you look at the average age of businesses in Fundsmith, like the average founding year is like in the 1920s. OK, Terry Smith is very serious about finding companies that you know, can't really be disrupted, right? Sure, any company can be disrupted, but, you know, really looking at that, okay? Uh, industries, businesses that have huge moats, uh, a lot going for them in terms of being able to ward off competition, particularly uh, competition from, you know, the, the technology innovation age that we're in. Uh, we like companies that create an intangible value that enables them to have premium pricing and premium returns, right? So oil and gas is a commodity, right? The lowest price is going to win. If you're asked, you know, what gas station do you go to? Uh, you know, Terry Smith, you know, interviewed some people about this. And they say, oh, the one just passed the stoplight, right? A couple blocks up. And he said, well, well, what company is that? You know, is it BP? Is it Chevron? Is it... Exxon Mobil, what is it? He's a, they say, I don't know, right? It's just the one past the stoplight. So there's no brand value in oil and gas, okay? It's, it's a commodity. And that is not where Terry Smith wants to play. Um, we like companies that even at the bottom of the business cycle are still making a very good return. Uh, that's very important. Um... <laughs> What else? The auto industry is a terrible business. There's, there's a chart shown. Uh, Terry Smith shows a chart. It's similar for the auto business and the airline business, where a return on capital employed is compared with a cost of capital. Okay, And consistently, over the decades, if you look at the average kind of auto company or airline company, a cost of capital is higher than return on capital employed. OK, these industries destroy shareholder value. OK, so uh, that that is not those are not industries for Terry Smith. Uh, he's asked, why have we not invested in Amazon? I thought this was really interesting. Uh, so the core retail e-commerce business for Amazon is barely profitable. OK, it's like a, a 2 percent margin or something like that. Uh, two or three percent. A charity. So Tweety Brown said about Amazon, uh, "It's a charity for consumers funded by Wall Street." Okay, because they're really not making any money on it. Um, 
AWS is number two in the world of cloud only to Microsoft. Uh, if Bezos would float off Amazon Web Services, we'd be very interested, right? It's like 30% uh, margins. We don't like the idea of owning one business that is subsidizing a barely profitable business, okay? So you got Amazon Web Services subsidizing effectively uh, the e-commerce business. Uh, people assume there has to be some kind of synergy between the cloud business, AWS, and the e-commerce business. Terry Smith doesn't know of any synergy between AWS and e-commerce. It just so happens that they're both under the umbrella of Amazon. Um, he's asked about Google. Terry Smith says, Google is a terrific search-based digital advertising business, uh, but the other businesses are very unprofitable. Uh, looking at returns alone is not that helpful. Well, this is a separate thing. So Google, uh, it's really interesting. Terry Smith has sort of a, a conspiracy theory idea that um, Google is buying companies like they made 200 plus acquisitions in recent years and so many of those have not worked out like the track record is so bad he thinks they must be trying to make it that bad like they're buying companies because the companies are perceived as a threat to google and then they're just sort of making them disappear right and he thinks you know if that's happening uh, it's likely that the numbers, right, the metrics for Google are going to start to improve, right, because all the competition uh, is going to disappear. So that, that was an interesting theory that uh, Terry Smith laid out there. Um, so another, another insight. He talks about, you know, he's asked about a couple different funds in the UK that have just destroyed uh, in terms of returns over the last five years, what Fundsmith has been able to do. And Terry Smith points out, looking at returns alone is not that helpful. Uh, what risks are you taking to get those returns? Okay. And this isn't just some, you know, thought exercise, right? Risk is real. And the reason risk is real is because volatility impacts people's ability to stick with the strategy over time all right there's only so much pain that humans can withstand before you know they're forced to or they they abandon their strategy so the more volatile a fund uh, i would guess i haven't seen data for this but i'm guessing you know, the higher the turnover in terms of investors, right? The, the, the more investors leave and show up when the, the returns come back. Uh, and that's just terrible for long-term investor returns. Um, and there's been a lot of, you know, points put out about how, you know, great funds return, say they return 15%, right? Net to investors, but the actual investors in the funds have done so much worse than that. And it's because they pile in when the fund is doing well and they flood out when the fund is doing poorly. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily ha it have anything to do with the skill of the management team, right? Uh, of the fund managers. It's natural, right? It's, it's how markets work. This vacillation between fear and greed. So it's just part of the game. Uh, but investors, you know, they, they, a lot of them just don't know how to manage their own emotions in response to that. So because of that, funds that are very volatile uh, often do a disservice to, to shareholders because, or investors because they can't stay in. It's just too much pain. So uh, that was, a, you know, I think that's a very valid point that Terry Smith points out. Uh, investors can sleep easier at night and make better decisions. Um, let's see. He's asked about Bitcoin. I mean, he says, you know, at first he says, I shouldn't talk about it because, you know, I, I just don't know enough about it. But he says, with that said, 
uh, I'll share some thoughts. Uh, he's not sure it's investing at all. Really, to him, it's greater fool theory, where you're buying, uh, hoping you can sell at a higher price to someone else. There's no intrinsic value to Bitcoin. Uh, and it's really just speculating. Um, he's asked, what is your biggest concern in the market right now? Uh, for him, his biggest concern relates to investor psychology. It's that at some point we will underperform. Okay, that's inevitable. Uh, what goes up, you know, it's, it's just part of the game, right? Outperform, underperform, no fund, no manager outperforms all of the time. Okay, that's, that's just not a thing that happens. And uh, I appreciated his uh, comparison between investing and the Tour de France how you've got, you know, many stages in the Tour de France. And uh, there's been seven times in the Tour de France where the winner of the race hasn't won a single stage, right? Um, but they've performed well in most of the stages, well enough to end up winning the race. And that's, you know, I think, a great parallel uh, between, you know, in terms of investing, where, you know, if you're constantly comparing yourself to whoever is doing best, uh, it is just a recipe for disaster. Uh, nobody is going to do the best in every market environment. And I think that's a, that's a really important point as well. Um, so the goal for Fundsmith, we want to have the highest return for the risk that we assume among global equity funds. Okay, that's that's the core goal of Fundsmith, the highest return for the risk that we take. Um, this was an interesting point about Microsoft. Microsoft is so far from being finished, right? This when when Fundsmith first bought into Microsoft, which I don't think was that long ago, you know. Uh, investors were concerned that think, well, isn't Microsoft dying, right? Haven't they done everything they're going to be able to do? Why, why are we investing in Microsoft? Terry Smith points out, Microsoft is so far from being finished that it creates a new company in value terms about the size of Sage. So Sage is a UK uh, company, I believe, in the healthcare space. Uh, the UK's biggest software company, sorry, software company, every two months. So Microsoft creates a new company the size of Sage every two months. All right. Just an incredible spawner Microsoft is. Um, so every presentation, every annual meeting, Terry Smith talks about the five companies that contributed most uh, to the last year's performance and the five companies that detracted most from the last five years' performance. And, you know, it, it's, it's often these familiar names, the, the same, you know, 10 or so companies that continually show up in the companies that contributed most, you know, to the outperformance of the fund. Uh, you see Microsoft up there, Facebook, Intuit, PayPal, and the point here is you make money with old friends, okay? Uh, great businesses will repeatedly show up as the largest contributors to the portfolio. Uh, there's, just, there's no substitute for owning great businesses for a long time uh, in terms of compounding your wealth. Um, Right, most of the things we buy are initially poor performers, right? So the return on capital employed, the gross margin. I mean, I mean, we saw recently, right, with um, what was it, Nike? Just took a big hit, right, with return on capital employed. Um, so. They're initially poor performers. We buy them during periods of weakness, right? So great businesses aren't usually on sale, okay? It's, it's usually you have to pay up quite a bit to own great businesses. Sometimes uh, there's a glitch, 
right? And it's a short-term glitch. You know, Warren Buffett buying American Express with the salad oil scandal, uh, a pandemic shutting down um, Nike stores and Starbucks stores. Uh, these are short-term glitches. Uh, and so they allow us to buy into these great businesses, right, at a 5.6%, at a you know, free cash flow yield, forward free cash flow yield, um, or 6.6%, 6 per, 6 right? These are very reasonable prices for great businesses. Um, so, yeah, that that's... Uh, most of the things we buy are initially poor performers, at least, uh, through these metrics. Um, right, I mentioned this. Our companies are more expensive than the index, but they are much, much better than the index, right? So you give up a little bit with the price paid compared to the average, uh, but you get so much more in terms of long-term performance. Uh, that just that return on, on capital that uh, has staying power. Um, let's see. So he's asked about Apple, right? Apple's a hot topic, right? It's the largest public company in the U.S., um, maybe in the world. I, I can't remember if there's a company in Saudi Arabia... Aramco that's uh, that's bigger but uh, you know it's funny everyone else while everyone else is bullish on Apple right Apple can do no wrong uh, Terry Smith is actually skeptical about Apple and he showed a few charts uh, this was in the February 2020 annual meeting uh, and he's skeptical about Apple's ability to innovate and grow without Steve Jobs okay if you look at the uh, income growth uh, you know, in, in Jobs' sort of first stint with Apple, I mean, it's just like an, uh, an exponential growth curve. When Steve Jobs left, uh, it was stagnant, right? Steve Jobs came back, you know, you, get, you got the uh, boost again, uh, the growth. And since then, it's been kind of stagnant uh, in terms of free cash flow. So, um it's it's I, I love finding investors who are able to you know ignore all the noise, ignore all the hype about whatever's hot in the market and just look at them very rationally uh, and see what what most people don't see. And, and that's not to say Apple isn't going to play out to be a fantastic investment over time. Uh, but Terry Smith, um, you know, isn't touching Apple uh, at, at kind of where it is currently, which I thought was interesting. Um, we just have a few more here. Ooh, he's asked, why don't you hold any Chinese or Indian stocks? Okay, in Fundsmith. Uh, he said, you don't actually own Chinese tech companies, okay? Referring to Tencent and Alibaba. Um, our tech companies mostly can't operate in China, talking about U.S. tech companies. Um, VIEs, variable interest entities, where you don't really own it, but they'll send you some money if they feel like it. On the Day of Judgment, that won't be there, right? You're, basically what he's saying is you're not protected. You don't actually own the business of Alibaba in Tencent as a foreign investor. Um, he also talks about how the return on capital employed for Alibaba is 8%. I mean, that's at least what it has been recently. Uh, and I actually ran the numbers. It's 8% for the last 12 months. Um, so, you know, doesn't fit the framework uh, that Terry Smith uses. He says Tencent is probably the one Chinese internet company that if we weren't scared by the ownership structure or the VIE, uh, and government influence, maybe we could own it, right? The metrics are almost there. Re the return on capital employed is 19%, which isn't bad. It's not great. It's kind of somewhere in between uh, the S&P 500 and 
the average of Fundsmith companies. Uh, he talks a bit about Amazon here. If I had to choose the company that Amazon is most vulnerable to, it wouldn't be Alibaba, okay? Uh, it would be Walmart. That surprised me. And of course, I, I thought of how bullish Ray Dalio and Bridgewater is on Walmart. I don't know many U.S. investors. Um, I actually want to look it up real quick here that are bullish on Walmart at the moment. Let's see who owns Walmart, just out of curiosity. Three, so the Gates Foundation, you know, 4.5%. 4 and that's about it, right? I mean, Lee Ainsley and Tom Russo, I mean, that there's no conviction. It's really just sort of a, a teaser position. So, I mean, people are sleeping on Walmart. Uh, and here you've got Terry Smith saying, don't sleep on Walmart uh, or, you know, watch out Amazon. Uh, and he says more. He says, watch what Walmart and Costco do to Amazon. Uh, they have a fantastic reach uh, in terms of... Um, you know, customers that are in the ecosystem already. Uh, and they are unparalleled in getting the cost of the product down for consumers, okay? Driving those costs uh, and therefore prices by way of costs uh, low, right? Lower than, than anyone else is able to do. Um, so watch out for, for Walmart, Amazon. Um, the, this was fascinating. The average item sold on Amazon costs $8 and 32 cents, right? That's, you know, what you have to pay for the average item on Amazon. The average cost of fulfillment is $10 and 59 cents. Okay. So it's costing Amazon two dollars more than two dollars to fulfill the average item on amazon okay <laughs> dairy smith jokes i could run a big business like that right give me the money i will run a business like that um <laughs> so it'll be fascinating to see how things play out with amazon if if aws gets split off from the e-commerce business you know, it'll be, it'll be really interesting to see what happens with the e-commerce business. Um, yeah, so this brings us to the 2019 annual meeting, and I didn't have many notes on this one. Let's see if there's anything here. So a quote from Buffett, time is the friend of the good business. Okay, and that's, I mean, really what Fundsmith is all about. If you overpay for a great business, the growth over time will bail you out, okay? And there's a fantastic chart from this 2019 annual meeting uh, that kind of highlights some, some popular value stocks in 2015 and kind of looking at them in 2020 or 2019, what is the price to earnings ratio? And then, you know, some, some growth stocks that obviously in hindsight have done very well and what the price to earnings ratio is based on today's earnings and the price that would have been paid in 2015. Um, they're in the single digits, right? Whereas they were somewhere in the hundreds um, or at least a hundred back five years ago. So that's just, you know, illustrating, you know, a great business will bail you out if you pay too much. But of course, it has to actually be a great business and have that uh, staying power. Um, this is something that Pabrai pointed out about Terry Smith. I don't try to find winners, okay? I bet on the companies that have already won. And, you know, it, it's clear which companies have already won if you're looking at companies that have been around for many decades, right? And they're still showing uh, incredibly strong 
return on capital employed, gross margins, free cash flow yields. I mean, you know who the winners are. Uh, I guess the, the key thing is understanding, can the winners continue winning? Um, and there's industries you can shop around in where there's less susceptibility, less vulnerability to technological innovation, which uh, Fundsmith tends to focus on th those areas. Um, right, human beings are really bad at working out the effect of differential compound growth rates over a long period of time. We're very bad at doing kind of compound math in our heads, okay? That's the power of the rule of 72. Um, it's the power of really just getting more and more comfortable with, you know, what compounding at high rates of return can do for your portfolio over time. Uh, how, you know, even if you pay a high price, if you can get, uh, companies that can reinvest at high rates over a long period of time uh, may be worth paying up for them. So, uh, but, but we're, we're not very good at doing that kind of thing, uh, us humans. Um, so a few industries Terry Smith will avoid, will never be in. Okay, and I like this. It's just so clear. It's like, and it, it really makes the job of investing easier you can just get rid of entire swaths of the market. We will never own a bank. Uh, we'll never own an insurance company, a real estate business, nothing heavily cyclical. Uh, resource companies like oil and gas, um, utilities, airlines, um, auto companies, none of that. Immediately that's off the table. Uh, and, and the big thing are um, consumer goods, uh, you know, software, kind of technology companies, uh, PayPal, Microsoft, Facebook are kind of high up. Um, and then maybe some in pharma, uh, I think, although that's, that's kind of a scary industry as well, because uh, it's, it's just such a long shot that you get a drug from start through all the trials to actually go to market. Um, but that's some of the do not invest list for Fundsmith. Um, anything else? So he mentioned Ackman, which was like, whew. So uh, Terry Smith was talking about activist investors, how there's some good activist investors. There's some, you know, not so good activist investors uh, that really leave the whole ecosystem, the, the business uh, in worse shape uh, after these kind of activists come through uh, and really just try to extract the highest price they can um, and then hit the road, right? It really damages uh, the business. So he says, Mr. Ackman, who was involved most recently with a company called ADP, is shockingly bad. Uh, I'm not sure what I would let him run, but it wouldn't be my money. So uh, sounds like Terry Smith has a little bit of a bone to pick with uh, Bill Ackman. Um, anything else? Smithson, uh, the biggest mistakes. What are the biggest mistakes Terry Smith has made? The biggest mistakes I've made are selling good stocks, okay? And the example he gives is selling out of dominoes, right? Dominoes, I mean, one of the great stories over the last decade. It's like an 18 bagger over the last 10 years. So, uh, Fundsmith sold out of Domino's after it had gone up seven times in seven years. Okay. You might think, you know, that's clearly overvalued, right? A 7x in seven years. Um, but it's gone up another 100% right, since they sold, another double. So instead of a 7x, it would have been a 14x uh, if it was still sitting in the portfolio today. And he says, you know, these kinds of mistakes are usually a triumph of hope over experience, okay? Fun, Terry Smith knows that holding a great business 
for as long as possible. Like the math checks out on that. That is smart investing. Uh, but every once in a while, you know, you feel like, hey, this thing's really run up. I can sell, I can cash in, I can lock in this, you know, incredible return um, and move on to something else. But inevitably, uh, it's still a great business, right? And it was a mistake to get out of it because the thing you end up getting into isn't as good as dominoes, right? So uh, just to drill that in a little bit. Um, and then the last thought here, never buy shares in a business that makes things out of metal. I thought, you know, it doesn't always hold, but he said it's, it's usually correct uh, to avoid doing that. The products are durable, right? Customers don't have to keep coming back to buy more from you. Uh, and this is really, you know, it's quite clear in the auto industry where if there's a downturn, you know, you don't need to buy a new car, right? You just maintain your current car. It's going to run, right? Especially if you get a car that's reliable, you know, from Toyota or Honda, some of the brands that I'm partial to. Uh, it's a terrible business because, you know, people don't have to buy new product, okay? Uh, they really don't with, with cars these days. So, um you know, part of me, there's, there's sort of the environmental part of me that's like, Ugh. you know, don't buy things that are durable. It kind of rubs me the wrong way, but, you know, whatever. Uh, I'll get over it. Uh, so that's sort of a, a grand overview of what I've been downloading from Terry Smith over the last week or so. I hope you guys found this useful. Uh, again, hit up the annual meetings on YouTube that uh, Funsmith put on. They're, they're just chock full of, of great stuff. And uh, this book here, Investing for Growth. Fantastic. All right, guys, that's all I've got for today. I will see you all in the next video. Take care.